Next up, we've got Jason Pavlicek. Uh, he is a, a wise man when it comes to transportation benefits, how things actually work in the background uh, in D.C., on the Hill, and what that means and how it affects all of the work that we do. So, uh, Jason, handing it over to you. Uh, really excited to dive in deep. Perfect. Thanks a lot, guys, and I appreciate spending some time with you. Uh, first of all, I see in this webcam that I need to dye my hair a little bit more. Uh, it's not quite as crisp, pristine as it used to be, but I appreciate being here. And we're going to do as much as possible in as little time possible to talk about what's new in tax reform and transportation benefits. Uh, really try to separate myth from reality and also talk a little bit about what's next for transportation. Uh, because there's a lot happening, a lot that you should be aware of and involved in. First of all, what you see here in front of you is language from uh, the recently passed tax reform bill. This is the section of law that uh, that changes and makes changes to the transportation uh, fringe benefits uh, and what have you. I'm going to go through this in, in sort of three very basic steps. First, I want to talk a little bit about how this has impacted employees. Then I'll talk a little bit more about how this will impact employers and I think most importantly, universities and nonprofits where I think the most impact will be had. Uh, first off, for employees, individuals themselves, tax benefits for Tax benefits for parking and transit remain available to individuals. Really, from the sense of the tax law, nothing has changed for those individuals who receive either a parking benefit, a transit benefit, or a van pool benefit, which is uh, underneath uh, the transit code. Uh, however, what has changed for the individual is that the bike benefit has been eliminated. Uh, this is, a, in theory, a temporary uh, elimination. Uh, the tax law states that the benefit has only, the bike benefit has been eliminated until 2026. Uh, a couple of things about the bike benefit. This is not really all bad news, and I'll talk a little bit about more of that in a, in a second. But the bike benefit itself was sort of uh, constructed in, in a way to fail. The way the bike benefit was originally put together was that it could only be offered as a subsidy, unlike the transit and parking benefits where employees could um, voluntarily withhold funding. The bike benefit could only be in addition to salary. So the only way that your employer would offer it is if they gave you money in addition to your salary. Uh, additionally, the bike benefit could not be combined with any other benefits. So if you took transit 10 days a, a month and then wanted to ride your bike another 10 days, you either had to pick a bicycle benefit or a transit benefit. Uh, you also could not combine it with parking, where with parking and transit, you can combine the two benefits. Uh, a lot of individuals use both a parking and transit benefit to park at a transit station where there's a fee to park there. Uh, and in some cases, some individuals take half parking and half transit, depending upon what their individual situation is. So the bicycle benefit was really originally constructed in a way that, that it was not widely adopted or certainly not I mean, widely adopted enough as it possibly could have been. Uh, so what happened in the tax reform bill in terms of eliminating individual tax savings I don't think is really the worst thing in the world, largely because of what I'm about to tell you. And I'll sort of start with what the tax reform bill did to the bike benefit. While it made it, eliminated it for individuals, the transit benefit bill, uh, the tax reform bill, does allow for employers to write off any bike subsidy that is provided to individuals. Conversely, what the tax reform bill did is said that if you as an employer are offering a parking or transit benefit, those expenses are not deductible. And where this really is a push-pull is that employers, many employers, at least uh, for-profit companies, are seeing their corporate taxes being reduced from 35% down to 21%. Part of the way of paying for that was eliminating a lot of different things that employers could currently write off, including transportation fringe benefits and any transportation activity related to an employee's commute. So individual, you know, companies that, that purchase shuttle buses that are strictly for employees to commute to and from work, those expenses are no longer allowed to be withdrawn or uh, written off. Parking is no longer able to be written off. Uh, there's a lot of things that the IRS, though, needs to determine in terms of what is and isn't allowed. Uh, most of the time, the IRS issues its rules and sort of the guidance, what it's called, to employers 
through something called a 15B employer circular. I have been told on good authority that circular will very likely be released in the next week or so. But I've also been told that much of what's in there is not um, as, as detailed as perhaps uh, we would like it to be. There's a lot of questions that need to be asked. For example, these paid to third parties for uh, transportation fringe benefits, can they be written off or are they considered general expenses or transportation expenses? Um, parking, if an employer bundles its parking with its leasing management firm, it's, it's its landlord, uh, does it have to separate the cost of parking from the rest of their lease? Those are questions that we do not expect to be answered. What we do expect to be answered are very basic questions. And one I think that we'll have answered is uh, one of the hot questions, and this is whether or not um, money that is held in pre-tax, meaning it's an employee elects to withhold it, it is not in addition to their salary, whether or not that funding then is no longer able to be written off by the employer. It is my understanding, and this is not definitive, but it is my understanding that the IRS is going to follow suit with a lot of other um, employee with, with, with uh, deferred uh, programs and instruct employers to have to pay corporate taxes on money that is withheld even in a pre-tax situation. That is something that the industry is obviously going to want to fix. It's something that I think can be a detriment to growth of transit benefit programs. Uh, but at the same time, it's not something I think that is going to be the end of the world. As I mentioned, all these corporations are seeing their corporate taxes go from 35 to 21 percent. So many large corporations are going to see dramatic and significant reductions in their tax liability. So things like this won't draw as much attention, uh, perhaps, as it would if, if there wasn't that reduction. Um, so sort of reiterate and, and capitalize here, employers cannot write off for corporate tax purposes transportation fringe benefits, except for bike benefits. Individuals receive the same tax treatment they had before for car for uh, vehicle, transit, and parking benefits. Their tax status does not change. The only change to individuals comes in the bicycle benefit. They will not, individuals will not receive uh, uh, tax breaks or, or, or tax incentivized subsidies anymore. However, again, the employer can offer a bike benefit as a subsidy to an individual. It's just the individual has to pay taxes on that de minimis value. Uh, again, we expect the IRS to come out with, with rules on this today uh, in the very near future. It, it may be today, but it's likely it'll be in the next week or so here. Uh, one of the, I think, that the largest negatives from the tax reform bill and from TDM is concerned is the impact that this will have on nonprofits and universities. The way the tax bill is written, nonprofits, uh, and this includes universities, will have to take any money that they use for transportation fringe benefits, whether it's subsidy or free tax, and will have to pay uh, corporate taxes on that. I know that doesn't make sense. Why would a corporate or why would a nonprofit entity have to pay corporate taxes? There's a specific line item in the tax code where certain revenue uh, and certain money that nonprofits get is labeled as unrelated business taxable income. And essentially, any money that is used for transportation of uh, commuters by an employer, again, this is not shuttles, you know, intercampus shuttles, this is not um, university shuttles where they go from door to door. This is strictly related to uh, services that get employees to and from work. Those expenses must now be considered unrelated business tax, business tax income and must be written off. This, in my mind, is the top priority and the top issue that this industry has to deal with because this is, you know, universities, nonprofits, they don't receive the same tax uh, benefits that an employer will. This is a, essentially a new tax on nonprofits. And it's something that, you know, obviously we need to address. Um, you know, trying to, to sort of speed through as much of this as possible and some of the other highlights here. Um, I seem to have lost control. Oh, there we go. Uh, you know, one of the things, you know, I was asked to talk about is, is sort of what's next in TDM policy. Uh, a lot of our efforts over the last several decades have really been around uh, federal policy. But I think there's a, a shift change. 
And we're seeing a lot more expand, a lot of expanded interest in TDM and shared use mobility policies and ordinances at local levels. We see a lot of municipalities looking to revise or create TDM and shared use mobility policies and ordinances. So I think there's a lot of interest and advocacy that needs to take place at those levels. Obviously, also one of, included in that is transit benefit ordinances. Right now, there's a transit benefit ordinance in three uh, metro areas, San Francisco, Bay Area, New York City, and D.C. Uh, as of right now, there are uh, efforts in 10 metro areas and now three states that will be looking to enact transit benefit ordinances in the next several months. Uh, furthermore, uh, performance measures will become an increasingly growing part of, of not only transportation, but TDM. What impact will programs make? And I think it's important to, to make sure that as many industry professionals understand that documenting success is critical over the next several years because of how much federal money will be decided upon, what will be decided based upon the performance of projects and programs. So if you're not creating those performance reports, begin to think about doing that and begin to think about what metrics and how to do that. And then finally, climate change. I think with the U.S. pulling out of the Paris Accord, we're seeing a lot of municipalities at the state and local level really begin to fill in the blanks. What can they begin to reduce uh, their city's carbon footprint? And there's a lot of efforts uh, at both state and local governments to sort of integrate climate change into, uh, into their plan. So I think that's the state and local level sort of an overview of what's going on. That's not to say there isn't stuff going on at the federal level. In fact, just a couple of hours ago, um, there was a bipartisan uh, agreement related to the budget for the next two years, where $300 billion of non-defense uh, spending would be added to the budget. And that's a significant amount of money, and I think a lot of that may go towards a bipartisan infrastructure package. Uh, right now, it, it's very clear that, that Republicans and Democrats on Capitol Hill are looking to the possibility of an infrastructure package for different reasons politically, but I think there is a possibility that Congress will look at doing an infrastructure package. I think it's coming upon this industry to really look at uh, transportation is infrastructure, infrastructure is transportation, and that in order for one to be successful, we need policies that support the other to be successful. Too much of our effort at the federal level has been about investing at, in infrastructure, and not that that is a bad thing, but I think we need to begin to realize that we need to talk a lot more about better transportation policies. That's something that this industry will certainly, um, I think, have a role in, in saying, have a voice. Uh, you know, finally, there is the reauthorization of the transportation bill. Uh, that is literally two years away. So even if there's not an infrastructure bill, there's going to be a lot of effort this year to sort of set the table for transportation reauthorization that will really, it, it's set to expire in a little more than two years. So we are sort of on the, the cost in the beginning of that process. And then finally, with um, automated and connected vehicles. There's a lot of policy decisions that need to be made, a lot of decisions that are being made now about data security, um, you know, pilot programs, things like that will have a dramatic impact on our industry and TDM moving into the future. So I think it's incumbent to recognize what the possibilities are with ABCB, but also where the dangers lie. And I think there's a lot of, of interesting discussions that are going on that this industry needs to be involved in. Um, so that is a, a pretty quick uh, summary of, of, of where we're at. Hopefully, I think that's the quickest I've ever actually gone over all of these issues, and I don't think I've gone over. So uh, I appreciate <laughs> that was, time. That was intense, I, man. <laughs> I, I need to do that more often. I don't know how I did that in 10, 15 minutes. I need to figure that out and do that again. Well, we, we've had some really good feedback on the questions, uh, folks, saying this is extremely valuable. And so uh, one, one of the things that we may look into is seeing if there's maybe some sort of follow-up thing that we can coordinate on, on being able oh, to give wait. a little, little longer format. Uh, I did have one quick question for we, before we get uh, into our next intermission. Uh, so you mentioned TDM policy. How are you personally involved uh, with TDM policy these days? Well, um, you know, I, I'm no longer with ACT. I think that's, that's widely known and, and I wish them nothing but the best. And, and I've been was with them for, for 18 years and I think uh, a great organization. I, I, I'm very happy with my time there. I have no regrets, uh, and I wish them nothing but the best. I obviously represent other companies and other entities in uh, this field, uh, so it's it's certainly something that I will continue to stay involved in. I know there's a number of organizations that have reached out to me about trying to organize sort of a small um, 
sort of advocacy based entity that really focuses on on outreach at the federal and local level. So I think that's something I'm, you know, certainly a number of entities have come to me about creating. Uh, if you're interested in hearing more, certainly reach out to me. My contact information is there. Um, but I will, will, will stay involved in this organ in this industry and, and uh, through one form or another and, and continue to, to look forward to working with all the folks here and others. Awesome. And uh, just as a reminder to folks, we will be posting these videos and slide decks after the event as well. So if you want to go back and reference any of the, the slides that Jason has shared, we'll be, uh, we'll be uh, sharing those uh, in the next week or so once we get them online. So I'm going to go ahead and move us. Mm -hmm.